Welcome, everybody. Wonderful to be with you once again uh, for Brooklyn Raga Massive's um, continuing education series. We've been having classes twice a week since this um, COVID lockdown started, and it has been uh, actually really incredible and wonderful. So um, nice to see you all here on Busey. Um Today, we have a class we've been looking forward to for a really long time. It's with the great uh, Bansuri artist, Eric Frazier. For those of you, uh, many of you know, he's a um, disciple of Gopal Roy and he's played with many, many greats, played Carnegie Hall. He's worked uh, and, and he's a founder of Brooklyn Raga Massive. And like many of us, we uh, all wear many hats. Eric is actually a licensed music therapist and now a creative arts 
specialist, I believe, a creative arts therapist in the state of New York. So um, we're really excited to see all of his insights. Uh, Eric, don't forget to unmute yourself before you say hello. And um, we are thrilled. How are you feeling, Eric? Good, good, great. Thanks, David. Thanks for the nice introduction. Good evening, everyone. Yeah, so the plan is basically, I'm gonna hand it over to you. And great. if people have questions, um, please let us know in the, um, in the view C comments and, and we'll interject with some of those questions. And then we'll, after Eric goes through his, um, I'm looking for a better word than spiel, but his <laughs> lecture on, on <laughs> spiel, yeah, as they say in the music business, yes. um, we will uh, you know, have a, a more open interactive discussion. So uh, thanks everybody for joining us. And here is Eric Frazier. Okay. Hi, everyone. And thanks again, David. Thanks to Brooklyn Raga Massive, all my colleagues in Brooklyn Raga Massive, and, uh, and uh, my music therapy colleagues, community. Um, I'm really, this is one of my favorite things to talk about because this particular subject of um, using ragas in music therapy happens to be the place where I can really merge both of my worlds. Um, because as a musician, many of you know me as a pure classical player, and I also do a lot of creative projects like fusion projects and, and other things, songwriting and you know, many things as an artist. Um, and then I also have a career as a music therapist, and um, I have you know, many colleagues on that side too. And so to really bring this together is, is really fun for me because, um, you know, as a musician, I play many instruments, but as a performing artist, I'm mainly a bonsiri flute player. So uh, I get to use my skills playing many instruments like guitar, piano, drums, vocal, beatboxing, uh, many different things uh, to engage my clients in, in music therapy. And um, primarily my experience as a music therapist is with children and older adults. I've worked with children, um, children with developmental disabilities, specifically like um, autism spectrum. And I've worked in the foster care system with, uh, with children who are in foster care or adopted or in the process of reunification. I'm currently practicing at New Alternatives for Children in, in uh, Manhattan. Um, doing telehealth sessions now uh, as a result of COVID-19 and, and the lockdown. Um, so I really wanted to start tonight to, you know, um, address this from the very, very first, very simplest, first, most fundamental place. And uh, for those of you who are either ex really experienced music therapists or those of you who are very experienced raga players, uh, part of this might seem like really beginner to you, but I know that, uh, that, that many of you who are out there will really appreciate it if I even explain what music therapy is and what the basics of raga are. So I'd like to start uh, just by giving all of you um, something to learn about what music therapy is as a profession. So this website that we're looking at is called the American Music Therapy Association's website, musictherapy.org. Um, music therapy is an established profession in this country. It is, a is it, it is a credentialed profession. It's also a credentialed profession in many other parts of the world not only uh, in the United States. Um, it currently is not a credentialed profession in India. Um, one of my main interests is to be involved in some way in helping India to establish music therapy as a licensed credentialed profession. Uh, but really the, the thing is that music therapy, um, mus a music therapist is a professional who has completed a a training program in music therapy from a recognized institution that has a music therapy program. The AMTA has established many of the guidelines 
um, which the entire profession follows. So the definition of music therapy by the AMTA is like this. Music therapy is the clinical and evidence-based use of music interventions to accomplish individualized goals within a therapeutic relationship by a credentialed professional who has completed an approved music therapy program. Some of these interventions can be des designed to promote wellness, manage stress, alleviate pain, express feelings, enhance memory, improve communication, promote physical rehabilitation. Um, and so it's really important, I think, to distinguish what music therapy is and what it's not. Um, and first to you know, keep, keep it right here on the American Music Therapy Association's uh, language about this. Um, music therapy is not, for example, a person say with Alzheimer's listening to an iPod. Uh, there's been research to show that uh, listening to music helps people with dementia and Alzheimer's, but the therapeutic relationship between the therapist and the client is part of what is necessary for it to be music therapy. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for this that uh, I don't think I have time to go into right now, but um, there's also, you know, the notion of sound healing, um, which I wanted to cover. Sound healing is something a lot of people are interested in. A lot of my friends and colleagues, including myself actually, um, are involved in sound healing as well, uh, but it's different than music therapy. So um, many people in India, when I was there learning music and when I was there as a Fulbright scholar in 2011, uh, I was a Fulbright scholar to actually initiate a music therapy program at a school in Kolkata um, that serves children with special needs. And um, I, I got to talk to a lot of people in India about music therapy. And, and a, a lot of people had a very intuitive interest in it, but what most people really think it is, is the idea that you might, you know, um, and in terms of Indian music, you might play a raga and that the client will just listen to the raga, just maybe lay there and receive some performance of yours. And uh, in the music therapy profession, we call that a receptive method, uh, means that the client is simply receiving music, is not involved in playing or participating in the music. And uh, although receptive methods is one of the main methods of music therapy, it is, it is not at all the only method. And um, so the idea that, that uh, we are healing or helping people simply by performing ragas uh, doesn't actually really fall into the real uh, sort of the real definition of what music therapy is. Music therapy by definition involves a relationship between the client and the therapist. And then for most of, for the most part, it involves the client expressing themselves musically. That's the difference. So it's not just that the artist is playing or the musician is playing as, as in the role of a therapist. The client is the one who, who should play, who should find ways to make music and be able to experience the benefits of making music and expressing themselves emotionally and physically through music. And that is really what we do for our work um, when we do improvisation and music therapy. So I'm going to start my slide presentation now to give you some, what this presentation really is about, um, is about using ragas as a tool. So like I said, you know, I play many things. Um, and when I do music therapy work, I, I, although raga is one of my, is my, like sort of my bread and butter as a musician, um, it's just one of the things I draw from in music therapy. And it is not at all what I do all the time. It is something that I don't do with all clients even. And, and when I do it, most, for the most part, it's, it's to try to achieve the possibility for a client to engage in musical improvisation of playing along with me. 
Um, and who are these clients? Um, remember, we're talking about um, children and adults, but with special needs, intellectual disabilities, um, autism spectrum, uh, mental disorders, and things like that. So uh, the, the capabilities and the, the basic like skill level and capabilities of people has a wide range. And uh, so we need to be able to set up some of the simplest ways possible for people to join us. Because those who benefit from music therapy are not necessarily musicians or even having any musical ability or history playing music at all, who can still really um, resonate with music therapy and be reached by music therapy. So since we're talking about ragas, for all the uh, beginner players out there, um, let's start at the beginning. So I'm gonna set my, my drone here to the key of E. And I'm going to teach you the solfege of Indian music, something that we call sargam. So just like in Western music, you have do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. In Indian music, you have sa, de, ga, ma, fa, dha, ni, sa. So I'll play the notes. And then um, I'd love to, wherever you are sitting out there, have you join me to try to sing the scale a couple of times so that you can get yourself acquainted with the notes. join me to sing the first uh, bar of soap of uh, Sargam. Sarve Gama Parga Nisa Sani Dapa Ma Okay, so what makes a raga not just a scale? Well, I'm going to show you a very, very beautiful rag that is very simple because it only has five notes. And technically that means it's pentatonic, right? We often think of pentatonic as the Chinese pentatonic scale, but pentatonic technically means the scale has five, five notes in it only. Uh, so this first one called Hansa Dhani is something I use a lot with children uh, because of the simplicity of it and um, the accessibility of the mood of this piece. You see the swaras or the notes of the raga there, right? And then there's key phrases. So um, Remembering that uh, the point here is not that all of, that anyone needs to be a maestro of Indian music to draw from this scale. Um, this is not for performance. Um, what I'm teaching is not for performance. It is for using as a way to engage people in playing along with you in improvisation. You can play whatever you want with this scale. Scale itself provides plenty of room to play with the tones. So uh, we'll start with just singing the swaras of, of this rag Hansadani. Sa re ga pa mi sa.
And actually, I'm thinking it would be better for all of us to do this in the key of C. So I'm going to drop down to C. And we'll do it again. Sa Re Ga Pa Mi Sa Sa Mi Pa Sa Mi Pa Ga Re Sa One more time. Sa Re Ga Pa Mi Sa Sa Mi Pa Ga Re Sa So I'm going to play some key phrases of the raga, uh, which really makes the rag's mood come out. Okay, but I want to just emphasize one more time to a lot of you who may have no experience with raga that um, this is just to give you a taste of the um, traditional feeling or vibe of rag hamsagoni, but it doesn't mean that um, you have to do these key phrases in order to start improvising. So as you can see, this is a very sweet rag. It is not an, um, it, it is um, accessible to, I think, pretty much anyone. And uh, Invisible Dave here. Um, okay. Could you What's explain up? why uh, some of the, 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 the lead, the solfege or sargam have capital letters and some is in all caps and some is in lowercase? Yes, because the lowercase means that it is below the tonic. So like sa ni pa sa sa is the tonic. Anything below the sa is going to be lowercase in this, and anything above the higher sa becomes all caps. Thanks. Um, there's been uh, there was a um, in the mysticism of sound in music written by um, Hasnat Iniat Khan. Uh, I, I distinctly remember a, a phrase about pentatonic scales are, are eternal scales, and um, there is a lot of there are many rocks that only have five notes, and I'm going to be focusing on those rocks tonight, the five tone ones because they're easiest to. Um, they're easiest to let people involve themselves in starting to dabble and explore in the tones uh, and improvise in, in improvisation. Um, so they also have this kind of like eternal vibe to them. And uh, it has been written in that great book that I just mentioned about that uh, internality of the pentatonic. And it applies to children and adults. 
So uh, firstly, we're working here. We have two parts tonight. We have orientation to the music, and that's what um, we've just begun. And then I'll talk more about clinical applications with certain populations, and I'll give a couple examples um, from my own work. Also, how to use uh, the ragas really outside the genre completely of Indian classical music. So we're going to use some of these scales and show you that you are free to use them completely outside of the genre of Indian music in clinical work. And um, this is not about performance, it's about music therapy. So that's why you can really play with it as you wish. So for those who need to really have a basic understanding of where we, where, what's happening here, um, you should know that there are two main branches of Indian classical music. You have Hindustani from the north, and you have Carnatic from the south. And then there are other branches that are regional and involves folk and tumri, bhajan, semi-classical, gadzal. Um, but the, 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 the system that I learned in is from Northern India. I learned uh, from my guru, Pandit Gopal Roy. And um, the, my first trip to India was in 99, but I began studying from Gopal Roy in 2003 in North India and Kolkata. And I learned in the Hindustan, Hindustani style. So that's the Northern Indian style of playing. Differs from South Indian Carnatic music. Um, I learned in a traditional way. I spent many years living all collectively, living in my guru's home. Also, um, uh, I formed some of my earliest, most deepest friendships with people who are still my best friends today, who learn Indian music. Um, in Kolkata also. And some of us went on to form the Brooklyn Raga Massive together. So, um, but my, my guru lived in a town north of Kolkata called Badabati. And these are pictures from where he lived. And uh, Guruji did actually um, pass away only a few weeks ago. Um, so I do speak of him in, in the past tense uh, at this time, but he, he's, his pictures here, you see uh, how simple and how sweet he is. He was a one. He he is the, the greatest teacher I've ever learned from in terms of um, transmitting music and transmitting the soul and grammar of Indian music. So Indian music has some basic components. Usually, it's either instrumental or vocal. The artist, usually uh, there's one center artist and there are accompanists. And it is largely improvised. There's a lot of improvisation involved. It is, you know, really like a great example of freedom within the structure because, because there are plenty of uh, usually rules uh, that one center artist structure to the music, but improvisation is a huge part of it. So here on the left, you see uh, in the, the gray, Photo, the black and white photo is of Ustad Amir Khan. Uh, this is a Hindustani North Indian vocalist. And uh, you can see that he's flanked by two Tanpura players. So the Tanpura is the drone. And you can also see on the right side in the picture of the Carnatic South Indian singer who is being accompanied by violin and, uh, and the Tanpura also. The Tanpura and the drone is baked into both the North and South in uh, styles of Indian music. And it is what basically establishes Indian music as modal. So the tones and the notes that are played in the scale all relate to the first note, the sa. And this, this sound that I was playing here is an electronic version of the tanpura. So really basic here, what is a raga? Well, a raga is like a body of fixed notes. Many have ascending and descending rules and all have key defining phrases. So if you were to play with one of these bodies of fixed notes, and we can call it a scale in this sense, although I've been 
you know, um, I've been told pretty firmly before um, in my studies of Indian music that don't call raga a scale. That's sort of the, the irony, uh, the paradox here, because the, if you're just playing the scale, it's not a raga. It should have the key defining phrases in order for it truly to be the raga. It should have that classical phraseology into it. However, um, if you take it out of context, you will find that there are many scales, just like in, when in jazz musicians talk about the different modes. But Indian music has like many, many, many more creative uh, ideas for scales. And so if you just play the scale, like I showed you in the raga before, if you just play with the scale, you're using this traditional scale. You're not doing it traditionally though. You're just playing around with the notes as you wish. And that is kind of the, the sort of the doorway in for music therapists to engage their clients in improvisation, um, to have new and interesting and novel scales to work with instead of maybe what you might ordinary, ordinarily use, you have some new territory on which you can try to build new chords and try to build new melody. Um, but in classical music, generally there's a time of day or a season in which a raga is meant to be played. Um, Ravi Shankar used to describe ragas as an entity or a friend. Like uh, once you really establish the feeling of the rag, it's as if there's an entity that comes and inhabits the space. And uh, that raga really, you know, resonates. And it feels to a lot of us that it's like a, a friend, an old friend visiting. Um, it's recognizable, but it's different every time. You never play a raga exactly the same way twice. That's because there's so much improvisation. There's the treatment of a rag. Uh, so different ragas take a different kind of a treatment. And, um, and then there's rasa. So rasa is the um, emotional quality. It's the, the human experience um, of emotion. And it's kind of, ragas have different rasas. They give different feelings. So there are known to be in Indian uh, mythology and in Indian Vedic history and science, there is known to be nine moods Actually, uh, these root moods were established in the Natya Sastra, which actually uh, is an elaboration of classical dance. Um, there is very little written in the Vedas about music. However, um, dance involves music. There was no dance without music. So we can assume that uh, these rasas applied to music also. And so the nine, you know, the sort of the nine moods upon which all different combinations of moods can be traced back to these roots. And so when we're looking at clients and we're with clients, it's really good to connect to, you know, at which stage in their life are they? And in which kind of daily presentation are they? And where are they in that day that you're with them? What kind of mood are they presenting? Do they wish to present with? would they like to shift into maybe or explore different moods? So these are the nine rasas. Uh, and you know, if you really think deeply about it, it kind of encapsulates the entire spectrum of moods that people can feel. So we've got, you know, humor and lightness and laughter. We've got anger and fury. We have disgust, we have fear. We have tranquility and relaxation. Um, going back to what I was saying originally uh, about, you know, I think what the mainstream sort of, um, for lack of a better word, um, not for those who are not totally educated about what music therapy is. Um, and when they think of ragas and music therapy, they think, right, play ragas and give people peace right? That's just one aspect of the entire picture of, of how we could use ragas and what it, it looks like. And it does not always involve receptive listening. So 
Uh, I just want to remind everyone at this point too, if you do have questions or anything that you can type them into the chat um, and then we'll be able to answer them as they come in. So back uh, a few years ago, I was really trying to meditate deeply on the idea of every note in a scale kind of having a essential character to it. Um, because I've been really learning ragas a lot and I, I was looking at how bodies of tones, um, how different sets of notes and scales could convey different feelings and moods. But sometimes, you know, if you break down just one note at a time, what do those notes represent for people by themselves? And um, I was doing this contemplation myself and I came up with my own list here, as you can see the, the, the middle column that says Fraser. Uh, and then it wasn't long after that, um, that I was researching and I discovered that I wasn't the only person who had done this kind of meditation on what are the, what are the inherent mean, what is the inherent uh, essence of every tone and how does it relate to human experience and emotion? So Paul Nordoff uh, was a pioneer of music therapy. Actually, Nordoff and Robbins is, Paul Nordoff and Clive Robbins uh, joined together several decades ago now um, to create the sort of original form of music therapy that involves improvisation, that involves client-centered improvisational pioneer experiences um, for children and adults, but children who have very severe and profound um, disabilities. They may not have functional language. They may be very much isolated and locked within their own world. And they were discovering at that time how clinical improvisation, playing uh, along with children, you know, putting out drums um, or other simple melodic instruments like metallophones, shakers, um, and having the therapist sit at the piano. See, in those days, they, they were very strict about piano is the, the therapist's instrument. And, uh, the, you know, they came from classical music. Um, but, you know, Paul Nordoff was an extraordinary improvis improv improviser also. Um, and so he, they were discovering how quickly children who actually had serious deficits in speech and communication um, were able to actually engage in music and communicate feelings and that they were having cathartic experiences and they were having peak experiences and they were having experiences that nobody had really seen them have. And it was really opening this whole thing up for music as a mode to do therapy with children with, with developmental, cognitive, intellectual disabilities. Um, and so Paul Nordoff came up with his list also about what does each tone mean as it ascends in the scale? And I was really, really sort of taken aback when I found his because I, I, I thought to myself, I am thinking about this too. And then, you know, I can see that this is something that uh, even the most legit founders of music therapy are, are doing research on and thinking about. What does each tone mean as you ascend the scale? And so this kind of paved the way for me um, when I decided to develop my thesis, my master's thesis um, about using ragas as clinical improvisation because I was really getting more interested in the idea of melody as a journey, as using melody, improvised melody, as the op opportunity for people to take a journey from one starting point to a culminating point. And that the places that people were, that the clients and the children were willing or able to go to in melody represented some part to themselves of uh, where they are on their on their own journey. Um, many times, you I would find that children were improvising and and 
we're not able to um, play more notes than just the fixed, maybe the first note in the scale or the second or the third note, not being very um, interested or courageous enough to spread further up the scale. Because when you start going to the higher registers, um, it's like almost like you're, you're coming out into the world fully. And when you're kind of holding back into the inner registers, uh, the lower register of the scale, if you, if you only improvise in that place without much flexibility, it begun to represent to me that it is inward, as Nordoff is explaining here, and closed. Um, and so by going up the scale and seeing the children that I was working with begin to participate in improvisation, um, could be on like a metallophone, like what you're seeing here, right? Could be on the piano. Um, if they were able to focus and actually use their finger to play individual notes at a time. I'm not talking about um, what I also would typically see, which is like just coming and just sort of haphazardly banging all over the place so that it's not functional. When we worked together long enough to find a way that I could really train and help the child to feel functional, which means they're intentionally playing specific notes, then you see how the journey towards the top of the scale in fact, represents a kind of coming out into the world as an individual with an identity, an individual who's now communicating with music and recognizing communication through music. Um, how do we read notation in Indian music? So this is the basic grammar here. If it is underlined, it means it's a flat note. Okay, so Obviously, there's no flat fifth. Um, and there's no flat fourth either. So ma is a raised fourth um, when it has the capital M in front of it. Ma is the fourth. But there's what we call tivra ma, which is the raised fourth. So other than that, re, ga, dha, and ni all can be flat if you have, uh, if you have the note underlined. So I'm going to come back to this graph here in a little bit. I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to jump to this slide because I think this is useful for a music therapist. So let's just take the pentatonic scale, the Chinese pentatonic. That is the first, second, third, fifth, sixth, and back to one. In other words, in playing the, in the key of C, the original traditional pentatonic scale that everyone thinks is the pentatonic scale sounds like this. So if you change the key, so I was playing in C, if you set your drone to D, and the reason why, again, I think this is especially useful is because many like instruments that children and clients can, without musical ability, can play on immediately are things like the metallophone, right? This, this thing, the metallophone, or um, because you could, a lot of times they come with only five notes, but you can also take notes off that are not in the scale, see? You can remove the notes like this, taking them off if they're not in the scale. But the pentatonic scale is one that comes ready-made frequently. It's something that almost every music therapy clinic has in their, in their closet something that you use regularly. So if you have the drone to C, well, the rag is the Pali, that's the straight Chinese pentatonic. But if I decide to switch the tone to D, the rag will be Meg.
Okay, so I'm actually still playing the C pentatonic scale. I'm just playing it now in the key of D so that the tonic shifts. If I decide to play in the key of E, but I'm still playing in the C scale, the rock becomes Malcolm's. So if you see how quickly the mood changes, the feeling of the, the scale changes just by changing the tonic. You have the same notes though. So uh, depending on where you feel that your client really wants to be and the type of mood, you can really move things around just by using this technique right here. So I'll go back to this. Here are several other ragas. And um, in this way, it's just presented as a scale. So you have ascending scale and descending scale. You can see that column. Those are columns four and five. These are the notes that are in the rag. Um, and these are the rasas associated. So these are the moods that you're choosing from. So if you were to decide that um, you want some, some vira, some sort of heroic, heroism, and also some peace. Maybe you should choose rag yaman. That's number two on the list. That scale, uh, that scale is very much like the Lydian scale in Western music. So in fact, it, it's absolutely the Lydian scale. Um, so, plan, you know, improvising in the Lydian mode, you might actually get some ideas by studying this raga. You might get some more ideas of how to improvise in, in the Lydian mode. So, um, the Lydian mode is obviously one of the most appealing and adventurous and mysterious and majestic scales out there. Um, so, other rags that are pentatonic, like Dorga, um, Meg, Bairagi, Bhupali, Malkons, uh, all of these only have five notes in them. And they're not like scales that you might know already or that everybody is familiar with. They can create a very novel experience, something uh, that's absolutely catchy and captivating for the right person at the right time. Um, so being, and it's just, it's fodder for improvisation. It's a tool for improvisation. So I wanna talk a little about uh, my work using ragas and the clinical applications. How can we apply this clinically? And when I use the word clinical, uh, we're generally talking about the, the treatment plan, um, the goals, and understanding the abilities and disabilities of the clients that we work with. So, you know, to work with children on the autism spectrum, for example, you really need to really have some a really good background about autism. You need to understand the behavioral issues that present, that, that um, may present on, with children on the autism spectrum, and also kind of what, um, what goals and what 
are the kinds of social engagement, uh, physical regulation, um, as well as language form formulation and use of language and expression. Um, what could be expected from a child with autism? Um, what could be, what what would be a what should we be working on when we work with children with autism? So the clinician knows about these things and the cl clinician understands what a treatment plan is. Uh, a clinician, uh, clinician understands what an assessment is uh, and also maybe working collaboratively with the child's other therapists and helpers like the um, social worker sometimes, speech and language pathologists, um, occupational therapists, um, specialized teachers, behavioral therapists, all of these people um, are kind of, and music therapists, are all together on a team that work with certain individuals or in certain, uh, certain sites or clinics. So what is the opportunity of Raga and therapy? <clears throat> I want to emphasize this again and again. There may be a wrong way to perform Indian music, but there is no wrong way to use the elements in musically interactive music therapy. So it gives choices for compelling and interesting notation. It gives you the possibility to improvise freely without thinking about key changes in order to keep the music interesting. A lot of us, when we are improvising, uh, because we grew up in the West and because Western music uses so many key changes, um, we may feel like limited by impro improvisation because we think that it means we have to change the key or the chord. Um, but when you just think of it in terms of the drone, creating a drone or an ambient, uh, an ambient drone that sets the tone, uh, that sets the root of the music, then Improvisation becomes very scale based and it really just means that the, the therapist and the client can freely play without worrying about what key it's in or whether or not there needs to be a chord change. Um, this also has the potential for specialized tuning. Um, many of us understand that Eastern music uses a different tuning system than Western music. <coughs> um, so that's really deep stuff with the tuning. In fact, that goes more into how to use this music for receptive experiences rather than improvisational experiences. Um, but this is focusing on improv today. So using raga as a scale, this is the most simplest way to use a raga in therapy. You can look up ragas online. You can find out that there are hundreds of ragas they're all different sort of um, established as ragas, but if you take them out of context, they're all very innovative and interesting scales. So you can use the notes in the raga when you improvise, you can commit to those notes. And that means you can just omit others. It gives you this feeling that when you sit in front of the piano with a client, that you could select certain tones, that you could ask your client to stick to certain tones by improvising rather than kind of looking at this entire keyboard and thinking, how do I make music out of this? How do I look at all of these notes laid out in front of me, especially as a non-musician? How am I going to make meaningful music that's meaningful, that's deliberate, when there's too much in front of me, too many possibilities, and too many notes that might sound like they don't fit or work? So. Choosing a scale uh, and omitting the notes out of the scale uh, that you won't be using really helps to narrow down what's available for a, a real meaningful improvisation. And then setting up the instruments for a raga scale. So using the drone, um, it's really primarily best to use, if you're gonna use two notes as a drone together, the first and the fifth in the scale. When we hear a tankura, what we're hearing now is the first and the fifth. But for some ragas, like the example of Malkons, 
I switched to the fourth <coughs> because there is no fifth in this raga. And it brings out the color of the rag by droning the fourth instead of the fifth. I was just improvising on that raga, Malkons. It has no fifth in it. It's better to drone the fourth. So that's why when selecting, think about, does the raga have a fifth in it? If it doesn't, then you don't need the fifth in the drone. In fact, it will detract from being able to emphasize the colors of the scale. Um, using rags for guitars, uh, guitar tuning, um, looking at different scales and then actually setting the notes of each of your strings on your guitar to tune um, differently. We often think of open tuning as like, you know, dad gad or the basic like things. But if you actually think about a rag and you want to set it up so that you can play just by strumming openly. You can hand the guitar over to your client. That the five notes or the six notes on the guitar are all notes that will be in the raga. So tune the strings to them. You can strum it as a droning sound. You could also give it to your clients in order for them to be able to play it too. Because um, many clients can't play guitar, but they can hold the guitar and they can strum the strings when they're open. I, I'm sorry, my child just came into the room. Um, we got him, we're getting him out of here, don't worry. He's only two. So, where are we here? You can make up your own rules. This is the fun. This is why I am so excited for people. I really feel that um, you don't have to be a traditional player. You don't, you can make rag as part of your toolkit and you can feel empowered to make up your own rules when you play with the scale. You and your client can decide together what are the ascending lines, or what are the descending lines that you'll play with? Which note should you stand on? Um, which way should you go up or which way should you come down? You know, you're free to use these scales as creatively as you wish in this regard. And your clients can also participate in that. So um, that can cover some of those compositional methods, uh, some of those songwriting methods. So that's why it's just useful in that sense. And it's it just, you have so many more ideas for scales when you um, just open up some of those Raga books and Raga grammar. You can search online for the notes in the rags. Um, there's also a very popular book called The Raga Guide. The Raga Guide is a great use, resource as well. Um, but um, you can find many different scales that you can use and you can make your own rules when you play with them. So I wanna talk a little bit about um, the psychotherapeutic principles that I've developed. So this is now kind of going deeper to talk about psychotherapy and about the way that Raga can engage people in a transformative therapeutic experience from within. Um, first of all, the 
the way of playing with melody in Indian music has opened me to the very much to the idea of, of melody as storytelling. So um, we can sort of, without using words, we can tell stories. And uh, we can really, you know, express a journey. We can express part of our own growth through the storytelling of melody. The other thing is um, reaching a climax after a period of longing. You can achieve resolution um, with scales because if you aren't, if you haven't climbed to the top of a scale, right, you still have a ways to go until you get there. And in the traditional form of raga to the beginning of the piece, um, whenever you listen to a raga performance, you will hear how the artist lays out the mood of the rag, but they don't go straight to the top. There's a journey and it's called the alap and it's before the tabla comes in. And part of the effect of the alap is to give some tension towards the desire to hear the notes resolve at the top of the scale. So you may be, uh, the, the artist may be presenting a beautiful alap and giving sort of a taste of the sixth, say the sixth note in the scale but never getting there fully, not resolving on it. Just showing how the scale leads towards the sixth without resolving. Um, and so when the client starts to kind of catch on to this game that you may be playing, you might make a game out of it. I'll give you an example of how we might, I'll, I'll keep this rag Malcolm's going, okay? But I'm gonna make a little bit of a, um, a play around the fourth. The fourth is the main note of one of the main notes of the rag. I'm not going to fully play it. I'm just going to make it feel like the the listener may be starting to notice like he's not resolving there. I want. I, I'm I'm feeling like I'm ready for that resolution, but it's not quite coming. It's like a teasing. <laughs> finally resolve on the fourth after a bunch of improvisatory phrases that are showing the direction in that towards the fourth but not resolving and um, that can create a lot of engagement and I've loved it when I've caught clients in that game and what I have done is allowed them to create that note at the right time so they feel that resolving in time so um, this is very uh, effective the other theory that I have developed is that called tonal saturation. It means if you continue to stick only to the tones in the raga, it will saturate the space. It will reach a point at which if you add any other tones that you haven't been using, they will sound out of place. At that time, the listener in the room has become saturated by the tones. Um, in theory, I wanna just, um, give a little nod to Ken Egan uh, from his book, Music Centered Music Therapy um, and schema theory. So schema theory is the idea that you've got the center, periphery, front, back, part, whole, the link, the up, down, the path, and the source, path, goal. It's like um, the directions and the way things are connected. So up, down, you know, um, up and down can mean so many things, right? It's a metaphor for are you feeling up or are you feeling down, right? 
Are you traveling up or down the scale? What is the, you know, so you can address these things sort of psychotherapeutically um, by using the scale as a metaphor. How is the client playing within the scale? The part whole, the integrating oneself to the notes, becoming a part of the whole, each note is a part of the whole, but then kind of experiencing the whole thing and then experiencing oneself as whole. The source path goal schema, the journey from Sa and finding other resting places. Um, striving, it initiates striving, like I was just demonstrating, striving towards a tone, wanting to hear that tone. Even the, the experience of striving towards notes themselves, for some clients, is a big part of uh, social emotional development. Having the desire to hear music resolve participating in making that resolution. It is a striving that can actually be, you know, an experience that can be cathartic in many ways and can be carried out into the world. I wanted to share with you, and uh, I'm noticing it's getting, it's getting a bit later. So I'm gonna end tonight by um, sharing with you, this will be my last piece to share with you um, a little bit from a case study of mine about a uh, client we'll call Gabe and uh, how I engaged this child in, in music making by using Raga. Gabe has, um, has autism. He's severely speech impaired, uh, constant repeating of the same words, spitting into and rubbing saliva on his hand. He has fixations on books and objects and furniture arrangements. Um, he's definitely a one of a kind personality. And so I began by working with the tonal saturation, the effect of taking one scale and sticking to that scale. In fact, in the beginning, Gabe was not necessarily relating to the scale, but I wanted to commit to the scale so that it finally would be, he would be saturated by it and he would actually really, really have that scale kind of in his mind and in his body and in his consciousness. So I chose a rag called Madhubanti. Um, his connection to the music was fostered by the familiarity of the gut. That's the composition that I started to play over and over again in Rag Madhubanti. I began to use improvisations in the same raga and he was thrilled and captivated by it. He seemed to follow the phrases I played with his eyes leaning in toward me. When I came back to the gut, he was muttering ya or making another approving sound. Through the tonal saturation of the raga in conjunction with the freshness and novelty that only improvised music of the moment can bring, Gabe found a motivation to strive and to see that certain musical passage were resolved, passages were resolved. Towards the end of his treatment, he used the metallophone to play the notes I was pointing to, to through musical suggestion in the raga without being prompted by verbal or physical instruction. I did, no longer had to prompt him verbally. The music prompted him. In my first 10 to 15 sessions with Gabe, I felt the frustration in finding ways to get him to connect to the music. He had extreme difficulty tolerating the sound of most of the instruments, and he showed his grievances by throwing tantrums. I tried playing songs on the guitar and also improvised new ones, as well as responding musically to anything he did. His quote, ticks were ferocious. I felt I had no real impact him, on him. In winter of 2008, after I worked with him for four months, I decided to follow my idea that Gabe might like it if a large drum was pressed into his body and played at the same time. <clears throat> so a lot of um, people with autism appreciate vestibular pressure. It helps them to regulate, it helps them to be calm. He was always squeezing other people's arms and hands, an indication of his own desire to be squeezed. I found that pressing a tabano drum gently into his body and playing rhythms automatically helped Gabe to regulate his compulsive body movements. 
In the same session as the first Cubano drum pressure, I sang some melodies from Rag Madhuvanti, improvising around the rhythm I was creating on the drum. I chose Rag Madhuvanti for a few reasons. Firstly, it is an afternoon rag. But secondly, if I played the raga in the key of E, I could set the keys on the metallophone to be in the raga, which allows me to keep the option of expanding to more instruments in the same session without disturbing the continuity of the tone. Also, Raga Madhavanti has a mood I intuitively, intuitively felt could capture Gabe's attention. The large step from a flatted third to a raised fourth. The phrase Sa Ma Ga evokes a mood that is awe-inspiring. Sa Ma Ga De Sa De Sa Sa Ma Ma Ga See the, the very log, large intervals um, were captivating to Gabe. So I began to repeat phrases in Magmaduvanti while holding a drum to his body and playing a simple rhythm on the drum. Over the time, Gabe began familiar with the tones of Rag Madhuvanti, absorbing them in a period of tonal saturation that lasted roughly four sessions. He was able to recognize the tones of the raga. He became more attentive to the way my improvisations would come back to his song. Recognizing when Gabe was being attentive was clear because his affect changes when he is engaged. His behavior shifted from radically uncontained to still and quiet. Um, just a reminder, this is a nonverbal child. So you can only tell his changes in affect by his changes in behavior. When he was most absorbed by the raga, he leaned forward towards my face, holding eye contact and smiling. He often did this when I was resolving an improvisation and coming back to the gut, as if to tell me, you got me with that. So I'm going to stop here. Um, this reminds me every time I start talking about this, uh, you know, we could really go on and we will go on. And so I'm going to welcome Dave back in. We're going to talk a little about um, the initiatives that we're taking as a collective uh, in the field of music therapy. We we'll talk to you about some new projects that are coming. What's up, Dave? Yeah. How are you? Great, great. That was amazing. Um, it definitely shows how much more there is to do and, and uh, the potential. There's so much potential in this field to embrace raga and, and improvisation and um, yeah, so uh, just to wrap up, I guess it would be great if you kind of let let our viewers know where what's what's what you have, what you're cooking up with uh, Aaron Schreg. Yeah, so uh, me and Aaron Schreg, uh, we're both licensed now. I recently became licensed as an LCAT, licensed creative arts therapist, um, and Aaron Schreg, um, who's been licensed for several years, uh, and he works as a music therapist in um, adult outpatient mental health and he has a private practice. Um, he's also one of the prim primary members of our collective. And so we decided we'd like to actually get Brooklyn Raga Massive to become a, an approved provider for the certification board for music therapists. In other words, we're gonna do workshops and educational initiatives that will count for people to get continuing ed credits for their MTBC credentials and their licensed creative arts therapy credentials. Nice. Yeah. Uh, so that's great. Uh, we didn't have a whole lot of, we had a lot of viewers, but we didn't have a lot of questions. So um, I guess we'll be uh, staying tuned and, and looking forward to uh, the rollout of that, that program. That's great. Yeah, if there's any viewers who, you know, if you want to email me later, uh, get in touch with me on Facebook, or if you have my email, go ahead and, you know, um, send your comments or questions over, you know, I'd love to connect with all of you. Great. And uh, just for everybody's knowledge, um, we have the next few classes, we have a, a hang with Steve Gorn, who's uh, kind of a generation beyond uh, most of our crew and kind of a, a trailblazer, if especially for uh, 
Bansuri players from the West kind of digging into this music in a deep way. So he'll be reflecting on his uh, storied career. Um, then after that, we have Swaminathan Salvaganesh, one of the great young percussionists, and he's part of, part of a family who's played with, well, who are most well known for uh, being in John McLaughlin's Shakti group, two, two generations now, and I'm sure he will be. And he's played with Zakir Hussain and all these amazing people. That's going to be based basically for musicians, but uh, maybe for everybody, it's about expanding your rhythmic toolkit. And then we have two more events uh, with great musicians uh, who play, some who play raga and some who play makam, which is the classical music of the Middle East, particularly Arabic music in Iraq and Turkey and so on. And they're going to be together kind of exploring and finding the intersections between those two. So that's our BRM education for July. Uh, you can just go to brooklynragamassive.org to catch up on that. So uh, once again, thanks, Eric. This was really special. And um, thanks, Eric. yeah, more to yeah. come. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thank you so much.